Good morning, everyone, and uh, bon dia, buenos dias for those uh, watching on streaming. Uh, I'm Bruno de Medeiros, a postdoctoral fellow here at Harvard University at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for being here for our second and last day of symposium. Uh, you might have seen on Monday uh, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services released the largest ever global biodiversity assessment. And um, this report showed that habitat destruction uh, is uh, resulting in unprecedented biodiversity loss with over one million species uh, at risk. The largest rainforests of the world uh, are being wiped out, and that includes Amazonia. Yesterday we learned that uh, this forest, Amazonia in particular, is being replaced by mostly by unproductive pasture. And uh, that's, this can affect uh, precipitation at regional scales as well as local scales, increasing disease and leading to tipping points uh, the, uh, in biomes. We also learned that indigenous peoples of the Amazon could use some help uh, to fight those threatening their livelihoods. And uh, that some governments in the region, such as Colombia, uh, are working on solutions while others, such as my own country, Brazil, are being part of the problem. Um, we learned that the goals, uh, we learned about the goals of the upcoming uh, Amazon Synod. And finally, we heard a call for action with or without hope involving several stakeholders. The indigenous peoples uh, of the Amazon have already discovered centuries ago uh, that one can build prosperous societies based on rich biodiversity instead of extensive monocultures. We know now, for example, that seemingly pristine areas of the Amazon show signs of past biodiversity management by human populations. Uh, we also know that the forest uh, ha has supported already tens of millions of inhabitants prior to the disruption caused by the European contact. Biodiversity conservation is not an enemy of human development, but rather can be a powerful ally. In this last session, we'll discuss ongoing and incipient strategies to create developed tropical societies based on biodiversity-driven economies by combining 21st century technology and the extensive traditional knowledge. Carlos Nobre, our first speaker, is a senior researcher at the Institute of Advanced Studies uh, of the University of Sao Paulo, and is, uh, he is at the forefront of this transformation. His connection to the Amazon started early. Uh, his first job uh, after graduating as an engineer from the Aeronautics Institute of Technology in southeastern Brazil was at the National Institutes of Amazonian Research in Manaus. Uh, he then came to Cambridge to receive a PhD in meteorology from the MIT, and then returned to Brazil to a highly productive uh, scientific career dedicated to Amazonian and climate science at the Brazil National Institutes of Amazonian Research and the National Institute of Space Research. Uh, together with Paulo Artacho, who uh, spoke yesterday, and others, they designed the LBA, Large Scale Biosphere Atmosphere Experiment in Amazonia, of which he was the first program scientist. He's a former National Secretary of Research and Development of the Agency, of, oh, sorry, of the Ministry of uh, Science and Technology in Brazil, and former president of the Federal Agency for Postgraduate Education. He's one of the authors of the IPCC report awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. A foreign member of the US National Academy of Sciences, a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, and of the World Academy of Sciences. Uh, today, Carlos will talk to us about the Amazon Third Way Initiative, uh, which is leading in a partnership with uh, his brother Ismael Nobre, a project uh, that I am really personally invested as well and has enormous potential to change the incentive structure favoring deforestation. So let's welcome Carlos. Good morning to all. Buenos dias, bon dia. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here, Harvard. And uh, I'm really enjoying this uh, meeting, this conference. Yesterday was fantastic. I learned many, many new things. And I, let me just start by uh, saying why I am moving 
from being a climate earth system scientist to something unknown, because really I don't know what I will become. I'm not an economist, but I'm talking about a new innovative economic model for the Amazon. Uh, but I'm in this transition uh, because really after 40, almost 45 years working with Amazonian issues, partly in the Amazon, I decided that only working in terms of risk warning is not sufficient. So I'm moving to help in solution space. So uh, I'm talking about these ideas that we are developing, this group of people, Ismael, Andrea, Marita, Adalberto Verissimo, who will also talk here, we call Amazon Third Way. Uh, thank you also to the support of these institutions and also the financial support of many of these funding agencies which are, are making possible the beginning of this project. Uh, yesterday we had a wonderful, uh, wonderful presentations on the risks that land use and climate are uh, bringing to the Amazon, to the planet. And in fact, uh, Tom of Joy and I warned of these risks last year. And one of the tipping points out of many, you know, Paul Artash also reminded us that uh, to preserve the Amazon, we need 1.5 degrees. We need reducing uh, global emissions of fossil fuel by zero by 2050. So it's not only the Amazon, but I'm, we are in the Amazon, we need to to really reduce, to bring deforestation rates to zero. And uh, so how can we accomplish that? And we also heard yesterday many presentations trying to address that question from many uh, viewpoints. One thing I want to highlight initially, uh, which is, uh, we know that for sure, but it's not as well known as the decoupling of economic growth or human well-being with a, a particular pathway of development. In, in the case of energy, that there is a decoupling between emissions and well-being and economic development. Uh, countries re reducing emissions in Europe and other parts of the planet, they continue to grow and to have well-being. So there is a decoupling. Uh, and uh, of course, we, yesterday also, uh, we, we heard a lot about this pattern of development that uh, tropical countries chose, uh, which is basically, I, I used this uh, sentence, what was coined in 1973 in Berlin, uh, which really, it, as a mark of the model of development Brazil and many other Amazonian countries, and also globally in the tropics, in the Amazon was the occupation of the Amazon will follow the cattle's footsteps. And in fact, as, as Tasso showed, 90% of the land clear in the Amazon was initially at least used for cattle, for grazing land. So that was the model of development. That was the stimulus that uh, other parts of Brazil had in occupying the, the Amazon. The geopolitical desire of the military government, the dictatorship at, at that time. However, we know very well today, and uh, but I, I don't think this is shared as much as the decoupling between energy systems and well-being, but also there is a strong decoupling between uh, the economy. You can see here deforestation in Brazil uh, falling down and the prices of some of these commodities going up. And more importantly, when you see total production uh, of agribusiness and deforestation, they are decoupled. So it's proved it's decoupled. And why still we are pushing deforestation? So uh, one of the reasons, and uh, unfortunately this, uh, this idea that you cannot really, tropical forests are hell, green hell, 
popular literature, films, movies depicting. And in fact, I mean, in the 70s, the, the, the governments of the Amazon, they had the same picture. You know, they had to go there and conquer. They had to bring civilization into the heart of the Amazon. It was green hell in their views. But certainly, as we have seen very well yesterday on the beautiful presentation by Davi Kopenawa, <clears throat> for them, the Amazon is green paradise. And the Amazon is green paradise not only to the indigenous population. As we have seen yesterday as well, the Amazon can become a green paradise for solving part of the climate crisis, biodiversity crisis. So we perhaps have to, to start seeing the Amazon really as a green paradise. And that points to the first problem we people living, born in tropical countries. We have a tremendous failure, conceptual failure, of never imagining a developed country based development on biodiversity richness. Tremendous conceptual failure. Our development models have been always copied from successful developing models, or partly successful developing models, from elsewhere. So we never had the pride of coming up with original development model based on what we have unique biodiversity. So this is a conceptual uh, failure which is at the heart, at the root of the, the problems that we are facing. So we have basically, it's before us uh, which way to go. Uh, and also Eliane Brun used the words uh, utopia and dystopia, I'm, I'm borrowing from her as well. We, uh, more scientifically, we use the names uh, sustainability versus fragmentation, but really it's, it's uh, <laughs> before us uh, these two worlds, it's our choice. It's a global choice, it's not only the choice of the Amazonian country, but it's primarily the choice of the people living in the tropics, in the Amazon. So, which way we go? Uh, that's, uh, that's where I started really thinking, uh, and we gave this uh, nomenclature, first way, second way, first way is conservation, second way is the, is the dominant mode, resource inten intensive development. I will review very briefly uh, what those two things are, and I will talk about the possibility of a third way. Uh, the Amazon has tremendous areas under conservation. 47% of the Amazon basin is some kind of conservation. Indigenous lands, protected areas, sustainable development uh, areas. So, uh, it, you know, should we, we be satisfied? Is this sufficient? Should be more? No, we have to see, and the TASO also yesterday showed the threat, for instance, this here is fire scars from the 2010 drought in the Amazon in the Xingu indigenous land. And this, and you can see here as well, the development, the traditional development, grazing land, soy, uh, threatening all these protected areas, and we heard a lot yesterday about the risks and the dangers. So only conservation, unfortunately, is no longer sufficient. What about uh, this other, uh, which is really the aim of the, of the common development models in the Amazon, and more and more defended by many Amazonian countries, and particularly Brazil, uh, which is to transform the Amazon as a big global farm or a global cattle ranch to address food security for the planet. When we look at the economy of this model, it really does not make any sense economically. Uh, you know, cattle productivity also mentioned yesterday very low. Uh, most of the timber is illegally logged. Average productivity of soy is very low in the, in the Amazon. Uh, in the US, it's 6.5 tons of per hectare per year. Uh, very low 
profits as well. Uh, unfortunately, we had tremendous hope that carbon would become a valuable, uh, uh, a valuable commodity in terms of ecosystem services. Uh, it's hard to say when uh, carbon will become, will, whether carbon tax, as you see IMF two days ago, released this report saying, you know, it has to be a carbon tax of $70 per ton of CO2, and that will make fossil fuel go to zero by 2050, but who knows whether that will become a reality. And in fact, I mean, if that becomes a reality, part of that can come and support conservation in a very significant way. But we do not know whether that will happen or not. And of course, if you look at the current infrastructure plans for the Amazon, it's the old, old, old uh, style. It's big roads, paved roads, big hydropower dams, mining, 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 etc. So if that goes on, forget it. The Amazon will disappear. Uh, so uh, thinking of that, uh, so of course, I mean, those are, you know, intensification, sustainable intensification of traditional agriculture is very important. Conservation, clearly important. Those are necessary conditions, very far from being sufficient. And I also I want to point out one more element here. We live in a time where democracy, representative democracy, is failing. In my country, total failure. I think in this country as well. And uh, so sometimes we spend a lot of time just to, to, to make everything go along uh, a legal framework, law-abiding citizens. However, in Brazil, they change the law all the time. So uh, the, the political powers keep changing the law according to the needs of some powerful economic groups, including in Brazil, the agricultural sector. So one has to think of something perhaps more innovative. And also, my assessment of this push towards the deforestation that we are seeing, in, in, unfortunately, in Brazil and Amazon, fortunately, Colombia seems to be changing or wants to change, although deforestation rates are high. In Indonesia, we saw a little bit of decline in deforestation the last two years. But in Brazil, I see a little bit of this push, and this is a idea of my mind, it's not a scientific result, by the fact that we are changing so much. 21st century agriculture is vertical, is efficient, is urban, peri urban, does not need a lot of area. Agricultural areas are reducing in North America, in Europe, in Japan, even in China. So this push I see because the sector, the conservative, uh, old uh, agricultural sector in some of these countries, they see that with food security changing paradigm, for instance, artificial, impossible burger, artificial meat, the need for that kind of agriculture will diminish in the future. So they are trying to get hold, to have land tenure, uh, perhaps in 20 years, agriculture will be completely different. So I see that as a desperate move to conquer the way they think, uh, seeing no value for the forest. So, uh, so that's why uh, we decided to think of a third way uh, that we, uh, I will explain why we call Amazonia 4.0. Uh, is a new development paradigm. Uh, of course, these ideas of uh, extracting value from biodiversity is not new. Uh, when I started my career at IMPA in 1975, IMPA's director at that time, Professor Kerr, uh, 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 showed me IMPA around and he told me, you know, the potential of the Amazon is biodiversity. That was 1975. So we know, uh, however, you know, how to translate that to, into, into reality and uh, uh, this figure just shows the potential, and this is also data uh, well known, that we have potential in many areas, exploring biodiversity. And some examples here are just examples. They are, except perhaps the acai berry, I will talk a little bit more about the acai berry. They are 
just examples of the potential. The potential is there. And this is all with the standing forest, with agroforestry systems, not with cleared forests. So the potential is gigantic, economic potential. Why this is not realized? Also, I want to give one example here, the merger of uh, biodiversity with technology. This is the example of a uh, uh, company, Natura Cosmetics Company. Before uh, Ukuba uh, was only used for broomsticks, so they cut down, it was the brink of extinction, and then the, the R&D labs developed a new product, a, a butter to be used in cosmetics from the seeds, and that multiplied by three times the income of these people. So this is one example when technology uh, can come into helping uh, to develop a better economy, a more sustainable economy. I think the best example we have is acai berry. Uh, let me just say, 20 years ago, acai was a local product with perhaps $50 million economy. Today, acai, there are more than 35 different products made of acai. It's a global uh, industry. Profitability, look at this number. Uh, 20, from 200 to over $1,500 uh, a year per hectare. Much, much larger than anything uh, that uh, uh, replaces the forest. This is a, a new data. You haven't seen that because it's a calculation by Professor Rawani Hajan. I, he did that calculation. I requested him to, to let me show to you. And you can see there the solid green line is the total value of production in reais here. So you see it's much higher for acai than for soy. This is soy and acai in the Parai state. And the dashed line is the area in 1,000 hectares. You can see there. So soy uses much more area, much low value, much lower value. And you, the last data, 2015, is the total value per, in dollar per hectare per year. You see, acai is seven, eight times higher. This is data. And this is $1 billion into Amazon economy, acai. So it's not only a dream. This is a reality. This mostly agroforest system which keep the forest there. So based on that, our proposal is really how to connect uh, the, let's say, the modern technology of the fourth industrial revolution, this merger of digital, biological, material science technologies uh, into, let's say, learning from the biomimetic assets, developing new, innovative, advanced technology platforms, and making that harnessing the biological and biomimetic assets of the Amazon, developing new products, new process, uh, new value new knowledge, and, and this is how to bring 21 first knowledge societies into the Amazon. So that's the concept. Uh, let me show 1.5 uh, minutes no, about that. Basically, merging 
these technologies with the potential of biodiversity really to try to bring in the last photo there uh, happiness to all the Amazon societies, including and primarily uh, the indigenous population. So uh, you see here a list, uh, wish list of what this, the pillars of this uh, model are. Uh, and of, certainly, I mean, this is almost, para, it's a paradise, it's a green paradise. It's perfection, uh, uh, inclusive, ecologically sound, I will use Zampini's uh, idea of this integral ecology. Uh, and uh, uh, I, sometimes I call this uh, tropical Scandinavia as well. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but why not? Why can't we think or hope? We discussed yesterday a lot about hope. Why, why in tropical countries we always think small? Why can't we think big? So this is thinking big, and we, we have to, to, to see ways really to bring that development, because it's, it's full development, sustainable, inclusive, fair, to bring happiness. So uh, also it's important to remember that this mode of development is not everybody moving to, to the big cities. This is all the uh, settlements, Indian villages, small communities, and uh, so we have really to think about this size, uh, over 4,000 communities. This is Brazil. If you add all the nine Amazonian countries, this is 7,000. So we have to think of a model that really address that, uh, that community. So this is a complicated diagram, but this is determinant, determinants of sustainable pathways for the Amazon. So on the right-hand side is enabling R&D in the, uh, the fourth industrial revolution technology, sustainable infrastructure education for sustainable development, some kind of legal uh, implementation framework. On this side is the implementing on local uh, and global value chains, bioindustries, sustainable innovative entrepreneurship, and agroforestry systems. So that's, we are developing some elements here, mostly initially education for sustainable development and the technology component. I will uh, more talk about those two. Of course, there are many challenges, and I don't have time to, to, to deal with all these challenges. We just list here a short list of difficulties to aggregate value deep into the Amazon territory, uh, remoteness, infrastructure, equipment, process, marketing and business, climate, valorization. Is it too expensive? Is it feasible or not? So I don't have time really to to deal with all these issues, but we are dealing with this. We are putting together what we call a coalition of the willing, putting together science, technology, society, civil society, NGOs, and also business, interested business in joining in this model. And we, we have initial answers for all that, and I can uh, really anticipate to you that it's very feasible and very cheap, very feasible and very cheap. Uh, so just to f finalize, I just want to, to give you one element that we are developing, uh, which is really to how we can really bring these changes to bear into the Amazon. So we developed a capacity development mechanism, which is how you develop capacity in the Amazon. So we call Amazon Creative Labs, which are, uh, so they are uh, transportable traveling labs that will provide these platforms for innovative experimentation in smaller communities, also in some towns and cities, in university campi. Uh, it's a place. Uh, for interactive fu fusion of knowledge, Technolo technologies, science, and also traditional knowledge. And, uh, and particularly, we are trying to create a space for collaboration, knowledge sharing, experimentation, and open space for citizens. So this is the idea of this labs. We are developing uh, uh, now a few of them, at least we're designing a few of them one for Kupuasu Cocoa, 
uh, and the, the, you know the Yanomami uh, uh, groups they have developed social biodiversity over thousands of years, particularly many species, fungi and also cocoa. They are starting to make use of that knowledge. Uh, so we are, with the support of Arapiau Foundation, we develop a first design. We have a full, complete design for cupua su cocoa. This is chocolate, a type of chocolate. I'm not going to, to have time to go into the details, but it's mostly bringing to, to, to the local communities how to process cocoa or cupuasu to make high standard chocolate. And cupuasu it's called cupulat. And this is feasible, not expensive, and we can bring modern technologies to the, to the field, to the forest, to small communities, and uh, capacitate these communities to produce high-end values, final products with a lot of added value. This is uh, a value chain of great value. Uh, globally speaking, I don't have to say much about chocolate. Uh, so, of course, I don't have time to go over, but we, the, there is a full design in which there is a, a, a fermentation part, a, a bio plant, industrial plant to produce chocolate there. There is a sol solar powered, a drone uh, port here, Transportation is by drones, uh, a center of communication, and also plenary space for exchange of information uh, and uh, teaching and also experimenting uh, interactions with the local communities. So this is one that we hope to implement soon, uh, and it will be our first one. The second one, I'm going to a traditional value chain to a highly innovative uh, potential genetic resources, immense potential in the future. Professor Wilson was saying, you know, the, the ecosystem science commitment aligned to moral commitments. And I think, you know, genetic resources uh, really make for that potential. And uh, uh, also we are developing, and uh, Bruno de Medeiros is leading this development here, we, along with Ismael. Uh, and look, uh, there is some difference here. Of course, a, an instrument like that serves the pur purpose of science, but in particular, there is this point of forest people empowered to get to the genome of species on, on their own. So that capacity will be transmitted to the forest people. They will be the, the intellectual uh, uh, property owners of many of the things that they desire to do so. So this is very disruptive, for sure. You bring high, high tech to, to the forest uh, floor, uh, it's highly disruptive. But that's the idea of, you know, we hope also to implement one soon. That, that would be a layout of this uh, laboratory with portable sequencers. And uh, so in, lar by, in summary, I mean, this is what these labs uh, intend to do really to, to bring this fourth industrial revolution in a radical transformative way to, to the heart of the forest. So my last slide, I just want to summarize. Uh, and uh, uh, Shaman Davi Kopenawa, I, uh, without your permission, I'm quoting you as well here. Uh, and also our, our famous Brazilian geographer, deceased Berta Becker, who created this sentence we inspire many of us to add value to the heart of the forest or saving the heart of Mother Earth. Uh, so that's the idea of this project, which is starting, but I'm very optimistic that we will uh, somehow put together this coalition of the willing, really, to science and technology to offer solutions, innovative solutions. and. Uh, development a, a, a bio-industrial model, but that benefits mostly the Amazonian people, along with empowerment and quality inclusive education for all the forest people. And uh, that's the idea, and I hope I'm very in, uh, thankful to being able to present this to this very important audience. And I hope Harvard University also will be very interested, and other partners we are 
inviting many partners because I do believe that's the way, one of the ways. It's not the only way, and not, it's not the only solution, but it is one pathway for a sustainable Amazon and particularly for the happiness of the Amazonian people. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Uh, let me introduce now uh, the moderator of the of the session, and then we, um, just like yesterday, we will we have a short presentation and a discussion at the end. Uh, so, Robin Sears is an interdisciplinary scientist with roots in forest ecology and anthropology. So, exactly the kind of scientist that we need to solve complicated problems in the Amazon. She has a master's degree in forestry from Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and a doctorate in ecology, evolution, and environmental biology and certificate in environmental policy from Columbia University. In her research and teaching, Robin combines conceptual and uh, research approaches from forestry, forest ecology, and political ecology to examine the relationships between people and forests. This work is a, a, at the intersection of uh, society and nature is carried out with the goal of empowering the important stakeholders with information to make decisions that will lead to improved forest management and more forest cover. Robin uh, is currently a Bullard Fellow at the uh, Harvard Forest uh, and holds consultancies with CIFOR and serves as adjunct professor at Hampshire College. She served as academic director of the school uh, the School for Field Studies and has worked around the world with ongoing projects both in the Amazon and highlands in Peru and in Bhutan. Robin. Buenos dias, bon dia, good morning. What are you, whoa, what are you, Kuha? <laughs> It's a pleasure to, to, to moderate this session. I hope we will have a stimulating uh, discussion, uh, hearing from the panelists and discussion afterwards. Um, I got my start in Amazonia in, in the Varsia landscapes and waterways uh, in Mamiroa and Amapá. So I have some roots in Brazil. For 20 years, though, I've been shifted to Peru where I've worked with smallholder farmers in issues related to forestry. As we know, well, first I must ask, are there any Peruvians in the audience, or am I the only one with my heart in Peru? OK, so I'm it. Um, uh, but as we know, of course, the Peruvian Amazon is uh, a, a big part of the headwaters of the, the, uh, the Amazon basin and uh, really forms and protection of these forests and waterways uh, very much influences the very long flowing rivers and standing forests uh, throughout through Brazil. I just have a little bit to say about Peru because I, I, I'm it. Um, uh, in the COP meetings, Conference of Parties meeting in 2014, the Peruvian government narrative about deforestation was that 90% of deforestation was caused by agricultura migratoria, migratory agriculture, which may mean agriculture practiced by migrant farmers or agriculture, shifting agriculture. My colleagues, uh, we found that to be a little depressing uh, data. My colleagues and I at C4 contested this claim, suggesting uh, uh, that, this, that the blame in this narrative is misplaced. And really, the blame is uh, one must look carefully at the motivations and the driving forces of, of deforestation. What drives the, 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 even the smallholders who do deforest? Uh, to deforest. We encourage the government to, uh, to really look deeply at the, at the drivers, uh, which they are doing. I bring greetings to you from uh, the current Minister of, of Agriculture, Fabiola Munoz Dodero, who was for uh, five years the head, the chief of the Peruvian Forest Service. She was invited. She regrets she could not attend. We invited also the current Minister of Environment, Luis, uh, Lucia Ruiz, who also sends her regrets. 
And I mention them only because these uh, policymakers would love nothing more than to have the data and analysis and, and the communication uh, sound bites really to convince their colleagues that the standing forests and flowing rivers uh, are worth more than the, uh, the timber, the oil palm, the mechanized rice production, more even than the payoffs to government officials for people to get 10,000 acres to hectares to deforest, that the standing forest is, is worth much more than that. So, uh, and I can assure you, uh, that Peru will be with you in this initiative to, to, uh, to look into the bioeconomy of the standing forests and flowing rivers. And today, with this panel, we get to that. Uh, yesterday, we talked about vision and the science. And uh, so in, in addition to the communication, the resistance, the protection, uh, what are the innovative actions and initiatives in the economy uh, that we could do to, to uh, promote these forests and flowing rivers. So, as Professor Wilson said yesterday, the goal, our goal here is uh, partially to look at tipping the balance towards action, towards right action. And, and, and I, I believe the panelists will share their experiences, their cases, their innovative ideas on how to, how to shift and tip the balance uh, towards this bioeconomy. Um, at the end, of course, we'll open the floor to, to, to the audience. We hope you will uh, have your contributions, your insights, your ideas, and your experiences. Um, I will ask if you would turn off, silence your phones so the pings and dings don't interrupt the, uh, the thoughts of the, of the panelists and your, and your neighbors. And uh, without further ado, it's my honor to introduce uh, the, the panel lists. I will introduce them as we go along. Uh, first up, we have, I think, do I have to advance this? Oh, uh, okay, okay. So, first up is uh, Brigitte Baptiste, Baptiste from Colombia. She's a biologist from the Pontifica Univers Universidad Javeriana in Bogota with a master's in Latin American studies from the University of Florida. She worked as a researcher at the Unit of Rural Studies from the Faculty of Economics at the, Putin, at the same university, where she began her teaching career at the Program of Rural Development and Environmental Management. Brigitte participated in many national conservation projects and worked in diverse disciplines, and I won't name them all, but including environmental planning, cultural landscapes, process analysis for the transformation of the territory, and biocomplexity, biospeleology, and others. Since January 2011, Brigitte is the general director of the Instituto de Investigación de Recursos Biológicos, Alexander von Humboldt, in Colombia. She has been a part of the expert panel of the IPBES and has been part of the national representation to the Inter-American Institute of Global uh, Change Research. Brigitte, please. Good morning, everybody. Buenos dias, buen dia. I am sorry, I didn't take the care to uh, learn a little of Kayapu, uh, but buen dia. Uh, I woke this morning with a very nice and happy news from Colombia, uh, which I got in Twitter, a ping uh, this early morning, which says, peasants from a distant place in a national park, which is in conflict, have reduced deforestation to zero, thanks to the agreement, local agreement to preserve of ecological preservation. Now they lead a project of ecotourism in a place, a particular place of the region. So this is to set the mood of what's happening in the edges of the Amazon in the in Colombia, which is of course part of the periphery of the big. Uh, uh, the big basin, and I'm going to talk a bit about the quest for bioeconomy in, in that region. Uh, the picture, of course, to initiate uh, the, 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 the lecture is from last year, and it's not promising, because deforestation rates in Colombia are really huge, and uh, they are increasing. We, we, will, we have been declared the fourth worst deforested country of the world this uh, last year, and probably things are going to worsen this after the reports emerge uh, on, on the dry season results of uh, burning and 
touch and burn uh, uh, forest. Those are the numbers. We are shifting from uh, 150 and, or a bit less uh, 1,000 hectares a year of deforested Amazon to uh, 200,000 more or less and going up. And the sad thing is this is happening right on our eyes because we have developed a very good system of monitoring and surveillance for the forest. And, and it, we are learning lots from Brazilian experience. And now we have almost the same capacities to analyze information, to get uh, satellite imaginary. And uh, we know that today there are some places that are still being burned in Colombia, despite the rainy season is going on. But we lack the institutional capacity to act, and we have to face some problems to really uh, Mm, understand what's happening, why this is still happening today after all the efforts we are doing. Um, we have uh, reports on deforestation of the country from uh, 27, 28, every year we are producing those reports and now we are producing them every three months and there are some alarms that uh, the National Institute for Environmental Studies are, uh, are mm, releasing to the press and to the and to the government and now is kind of the, an inconvenient truth because we within the government developed the system and now the government is trying to moderate the bad news but that's what's happening so we don't have only bad news but we are trying to understand better what's happening with the, the details of the deforestation the actors on the process the values that are that underpin those processes, why people still cut the forest? Kind of the same questions that Dr. Noble has asked, but in a very local uh, scale. So uh, the process of deforestation in Colombia is quite the same than Brazil and I guess than Peru, but it's also affected by two forces that are different from those places. One is narcotraffic, which is cocaine production and uh, destruction of the forest because of coca. And, and the other one is... Um, uh, land grabbing in the middle of the war. We are ending, we have ended, uh, almost ended a conflict of 50 years, and this has made lots of changes in the governance of the territory. So those, th this couple of factors affect really what's happening in the Amazon. Then you see there, there's a picture of a place in, in a National Park the, showing how is this colonizing process operating you see this, this forest with a very thin line going under the canopy. There's people going and cutting uh, the forest under to reach a distant place 40, 30, 40 miles from the origin. And then they establish a plot. They cut a piece of the forest and then they repeat this process and they create a, a, a big uh, grid of small plots communicated by uh, under canopy uh, paths. And then they start to do this uh, big, uh, bigger scale process. And then you end with this kind of very big illegal roads where people start to settle around. But then you learn that this is happening um, because people is demanding roads, people is demanding land, people is demanding uh, access to uh, resources, people wants to develop, quote unquote. And it's not just for coca production. It's deforestation in the Amazon, it's 25-30% caused by coca uh, uh, obligation. People that the narco-traffic uh, makes people to plant the coca, but people doesn't really want to plant coca. They want to live a life, a peaceful life, they want to grow, they want to educate their kids. So it's, there's a big issue around the type of development that we want and why we have not learned to live uh, in the forest. Why it's uh, so important for people migrating from other places of the country to develop uh, the, the territory, the land in uncertain ways. 
Those are pictures, this is the most recent picture of what's happening in Colombia. And um, the, the, the issues during the last couple of weeks makes me kind of a journalist here reporting very quick answers and developments, unfoldings of, uh, of issues. This is a report of, in a, in a very famous uh, journal in Colombia about this, this road being built in the middle of the most treasured national park in Colombia. Then there's the, the development plan evidence that deforestation is growing, and this is the kind of a turning point that the, the current government wants to produce. Uh, this are, is the government coming, the president and the Minister for Environment coming last week to the National Park with the military. They bombarded some of the places, they got some of the families, um, put them in jail to, kind of, to send a sign to uh, controlling, to regaining control of the territory. And then you get the answer of the local people. We don't want military intervention. We don't attack us, we are peasants, we want to live in peace. So the conflict is framed in a very political way uh, amongst government and local communities. But then, three days ago, there's a newspaper, a very famous newspaper, saying, we know who is deforesting the region, is the governor. It's the governor, but it's open, everybody knows it, because he is promoting development. And the governor is a very rich guy uh, who owns lots of cattle, and he thinks sensually that the development is should, should be that way. But all the development there is illegal because it's a forest reserve. So how come there's a local government with such a power to do completely opposite things than the law allows? But there's another powers, and this governor now is under uh, research and under under. Judiciary, uh, uh, say, yeah, investigation. Thank you. Uh, there's uh, the other force, which are the uh, the rebels that stay on the place that are still protecting the coca growers, and curiously, this far left, far right, and both of them agreed not to fight against each other, but to fight against the forest. So they are advancing deforestation and grabbing as much land as they can until somebody else, probably the government, the military, whatever, stops them and then they can start fighting each other for the land or for development. So it's a very sad story, but it uh, lets us understand which forces are behind deforestation and how, if we are going to develop certain bioeconomy, uh, uh, how, how should we take into account those, those forces? This is the national park I'm talking about, and this is how things are going towards that place. So what are the options? There's the Twitter of the president saying we succeeded in the military operation, and there's the opposite uh, communication. The sparks of peasants respect local communities. We can't stop deforestation if we sit in a table to uh, conversate for the dialogue. So I think that it's quite important to understand the issue of values. Which values underpin development models? Which values are on place when you cut the forest? Why people still think that the forest is valueless? And uh, how indigenous values, how peasants' values, how other people's values interplay to define the, uh, the pathway for this particular place on the Colombian Amazon and in the basin. So there's plurality of values in conflict. There's uh, uh, and, uh, 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 some different meanings for economics in the region. So we do lots of exploration after the peace process. There's lots of discoveries, new species. There's reports. And we are lucky to be in places where we never have been before. Lots of uh, new species and reports. I brought some here for those who want to read them. Uh, we also assembled new knowledge products for uh, the government, for the local region. Our system of information of biodiversity is now public, available. There's plenty of information about biodiversity for using the, that into decision making. And of course, we have identified lots of options for developing this bioeconomy. Options that follow the, uh, e the ecosystem services framework or the 
nature's contributions to people framework of IPBES, classifying, as Dr. Noble mentioned, uh, different types of uh, economic alternatives for this region, such as material assets, such as uh, price woods, fruits, bush meat, non-timber product, non-timber forest products, acai is becoming also a, a, a very valued uh, harvest, and non-material assets such as identity, notions of well-being in the region, and concepted pleasures, ecotourism, and sources of spirituality and adaptability of which are seeked by, I, I seek by, by urban people. People from the cities are going to the Amazon to get enlightenment. They want to, to be in the forest. So there's models of thinking from the ayahuasca traditions from Peru, Ecuador, and the southern part of Colombia that portrays a really a paradise in the, in, in, in the forest. And there's lots of people looking for paradise. And they go there, there's plenty of mosquitoes, but there's also nice rivers, cascades, and you, you know, paradise is, is still a bit of, of, of a paradox, of course. But the um, Constitutional Court uh, gave rights to the Amazon in a recent decision. So the Amazon now has agency into the courts in Colombia. And we have to respect and consider the Amazon as a living being. So that means that values in the, at the national level, the value of the Amazon is the highest possible. It's an entity. Um, who we are, uh, who are the indigenous people in the Amazon? In this place, unfortunately, they've been wiped out. They've been completely displaced at the best or uh, killed. And uh, so we need to think who is going to, be, to become the new indigenous of those places. If we really value the Amazon, we have to become the new indigenous of the Amazon, probably rescuing the values, the knowledge, the traditions, but also mixing them with all our uh, capacities. So we think about resilience, about many other uh, uh, possibilities of becoming uh, new Amazon citizens, new hybrids. There are some data. Everything that mentioned Dr. Noble, Noble here, uh, it's happening there. So we are searching for new products, new nutraceutics, uh, um, for uh, this is uh, ice cream made of camu camu. This, everybody is trying to improve their production capacities. And even coca is sometimes goes down, sometimes goes, goes up. But that's not the main trouble. There's oil palm, there's also coca is not the only crop, illegal crop. Oil palm is becoming also illegal in many places and and, and, and the, the guilt of oil palm in Colombia is rejecting those uh, those uh, those crops, those, those places being used for oil palm. They don't want to have nothing to do with deforestation. So probably we have to, uh, to, to cut them by legal terms. And there's carbon credits as well. It's in, and the discussion is going on. And probably in the next month, we'll have an answer for uh, the potential of uh, credit carbon, of carbon credits there. So there's the numbers. Uh, there's tourism approved last week as well to fly over the national park. So you can pay. And there's 19 operators, like in the Peruvian lineas, the Nazca, Nazca lines. And you can go there and fly around and pay a bit. Um, and there's plenty of people and, and capacities uh, flowing to the place. So the question is, could we find a new way to uh, create agreements, to work all together for building a new type of development in the Amazon? That's an open question, but there's lots of political action there. There's lots of alliances being discussed. Uh, but there's also dissent, people saying we don't want carbon credits because this is the takes over sovereignty of the forest is uh, dangerous to the indigenous uh, some still there are some groups of indigenous people with a big chunks of land that are being pushed away um, so there's also entrepreneurs oil companies coming working with us Institute of Humboldt and local authorities to uh, produce options and to really try to provide um, solutions, solutions for deforestation. So there's money, there's capacities, there's people. Uh, and the question is, can we make chocolate from oil, by example? There's lots of revenues coming from the oil companies that are becoming part of new 
uh, new production processes, they are coming to new um, alliances. So this is something that is going on, and hopefully we can answer this question. That so to finish, um, I think that we have to acknowledge that the forest provides many goods and services. Everybody acknowledge that, and some of them can be valued by market, can be used. Uh, uh, such as uh, uh, sources of, of income and money, but not all, all of them, that also we contribute lots to the global um, economy and the global ecology, and we feel that there's not enough work in terms of environmental justice, that the North is not doing, it's not paying, the, paying their dues to really balance the, the burden of adaptation, and uh, that the room for bioeconomy, it's open. I agree, we agree that that's the way to go, but we need a social agreement before. We need to work between local communities and, uh, and our political institutions and international organizations to really get a common view, a shared view of what has to be done in the Amazon to prevent forest destruction. So still there's Amazon in Colombia, come and have fun with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brigitte. That was uh, wonderful to see a little bit of Colombia. Now, uh, we move back to Brazil, I guess, with a presentation by Beto Verissimo. Beto is a co-founder of Amazon. I love this part, a think and do tank center based in the Brazilian Amazon, uh, founded in 1990. He holds a master's uh, degree in ecology from the Pennsylvania State University and a graduate degree in agricultural engineering from the Federal Rural University of the Brazilian Amazon. Beto has published more than 170 scientific and technical articles and 20 books on conservation and natural resource management. His work has helped create about 25 million hectares of conservation units in the Brazilian Amazon, I guess. Um, and support, has supported forest management for more than 7 million hectares of uh, forest. In 2010, Verissimo, Verissimo received the Skoll Foundation Global Award for Social Entrepreneur, re, Entrepreneurship. In 2014, he was awarded one of the most 100 influential personalities in Brazil for his work in the area of social entrepreneurship. And in 2015, he received the prize uh, of the newspaper O Globo for his leadership on conservation in the Amazon. Currently, he is also director of the Amazon Center for Entrepreneurship and affiliated scholar at Princeton University. So welcome, please, Beto. Good morning, bom dia, buenos dias. It's nice to be here. Uh, I'll try to be briefly. Um, as Carlos mentioned about the Amazon 4.0, unfortunately, we're still in Amazonia 2.0. And to get there, I'm talking a little bit about the obstacles that we're still facing today and we have to overcome to come to go from uh, deforestation kind of paradigm of development for a bioeconomy ecosystem service um, paradigm that come to keep at the Amazonia uh, as place as we're looking for. Uh, we are in a perfect storm right now. Uh, deforestation and forest degradation is moving up. We get about 20% of deforestation and roughly about 20% also as forest degradation. Forest degradation it means area has been affected by logging, forest fires. Um, very low social indicators today the Brasilia Amazonia is by far the poor areas in Brazil. We get all the social bad indicators, health, sanitation, uh, education, uh, security. So, and very high level of green gas house emissions, uh, roughly about 42% of the green gas house emissions come from Brazil, it's actually come from the Amazon region. And, we, and the GDP is only about 9%. So uh, we are really in trouble, and the three major indicators tell us that we are not doing well. Uh, of course, there was a potential of the new government in place that this all indicator can be even worse. 
We can actually increase social conflicts, increase greenhouse emissions if the forestation is moving up more than we expected. And of course, uh, the economy is not going to perform well because most of people don't want to invest in Amazonia because it's too risk. It's too reputational risk. So we actually, in the end, we are going to attract the bad investors, the bad guys is going to come. Um, so just to keep in mind, uh, we're talking about area of five million kilometers square. Uh, yellow is an area of occupied by uh, savannas. Uh, the red are the deforestation areas, the green are the forests. Of course, not green forests, it means uh, as a primary uh, full protected area. So there's a lot of area has already, as I say, in some way degraded. Uh, this is the social uh, progress indicator. That was actually, uh, this methodology was developed in, in Harvard by Michael Porter. We adopted this methodology. We, this is by counting level. There were 772 counties or municipalities in the Brazilian Amazon. Red, uh, yellow, and, and pink are the worst social indicators. Um, the green one's a little bit better. But of the 70, 702 municipalities in the Brazilian Amazon, only one municipality is a little bit above their uh, Brazilian Amazon average. It's, it's, if it performs at the global level, we are going to be a, in a position, in a hundred position, in a, countries, compare, in a countries that have very low social indicators. So one big challenge for, to get from Amazonia 2.0 that we are today for Amazon 4.0 is to reduce this, increase the, the color of this map, get, get more green, dark green. Uh, security, it's a very critical issue up, up, along the flow of the rivers. Tra drug traffics become the major source of, of uh, violence and this uh, homicidial criminality is affecting communities along the river. So, and, and then there's a question that go beyond what uh, we, as part of the team that work with Amazon and we can actually deal with. But it's becoming a very difficult place. Amazonia region is now, it's, it's, it's more and more occupied by illegal activities. Uh, and so that was, that was the case. Uh, of course, more threats coming. Uh, uh, Africa, we have a, the whole uh, economic crisis in history. Oh, we get three years of recession. The economy is not doing well. Um, the new government policy, as described yesterday, I'm just to summarize here, uh, less enforcement against deforestation. So we expected the less in agents in the field. The deforestation is going moving up. The last uh, five months, deforestation already has moving up 24%. So, but the most difficult months coming because we are going to uh, uh, approach the dry season. So we get more probably be more deforestation. Uh, reducing protected areas, so the whole the conversation is about reducing limits of conservation units, uh, attacking indigenous rights. Uh, I think it was, today was very clear about some of those uh, uh, threats. Uh, increase land grabbers uh, on public forests. Uh, we still have an area twice as big as California unclaimed public lands in the Amazon region. Uh, and I'm going to show a little bit the map. And this area has been the main target for invasion and for deforestation right now. And the, the policy, the government has no policy at this moment to actually to protect those areas. Uh, without this protection, we go beyond the tipping point very soon, okay? So we get no time to get the Amazon 4.0 if you're not solving some questions that actually rely on the Amazon 2.0 right now. A more social conflict, violence, I think the Amazon region is already a place with a lot of uh, social, social conflicts, um, and it leads all this problem, as, as I say. Um, another discussion right now is the end of the forest code. There was a bill on the debate on the Senate floor. They actually proposed to call for the end of forest code, and the end, if approved, the forestation that today are roughly around 20% is going to jump, can jump it up to 50%, because basically, roughly speaking, 40% of the Amazon is protected, indigenous or conservation units. Another 20% was clear cut, and we still have 40% of forests part owned by private people that have to comply with the forest code. Others are, as the areas that I mentioned, 
uh, not um, yet protected, meaning unclimbed public forests. So this debate is now in the Congress. It, it can get even worse. Um, so talk a little bit about the, the, just to make sure that we understand the, the, the difference between degradation, forest um, uh, deforestation. Uh, the, the light green is the degradation. As we have more and more forest fires, severe El Nino events, we get more the forest degradation can be really becoming uh, degraded uh, deforestation area. So we, we are not, uh, as, as we are in a moment of urgency. Um, this is the unprotected forest in the Brazilian Amazonia. That's the yellow are the federal areas, mostly is actually in the state of Amazonas, uh, and also the, the, um, the yellow ones are state ones, and the, the green ones are the federal ones. So we still have those immense, uh, a huge amount of, of um, public forest, and, and we need to, to fix it. We need to find a way this area should be protected and should be keep as forest, as Brazilian, as forest, as public. And that was a, a, a main uh, question right now. Um, opportunities, I think we need, um, we need global support, of course, to fight deforestation in, in the Brazilian Amazonia. Um, uh, the, there was a debate, and I think comments from Consume Goods Forum about to make a pledge from 2020, only timber, soybean, beef, palm oil, and pulp and paper comes from tropical countries, should come from zero source of deforestation. But uh, this commitment is not yet fully implemented. There was always a delay. Uh, so in market, if really the, the consumers, the big companies, want to commit it, such kind of initiative they have to make in, into reality. Um, payment for environmental service is a mirage with a potential reality. It needs to be a, a reality as soon as possible. Even we pay $1 uh, $1 per ton per year, that makes a whole difference on the equation that Carlos mentioned about here. We, we basically, we, we destroy uh, the tropical rainforest to generate about $50, $70 per hectare per year when you come about care ranching. It, the forest holds at least 100 tons of carbon, so we can, with payment of $1 per hectare per year, actually we can overcome the threat of pasture. And carry ranching is the major driving uh, factor in terms of uh, deforestation. Biodiversity economy, I think Carlos make a fantastic presentation. I think for the first time, it's a leaf, leaf, uh, leapfrogging opportunity. I think there is no way to keep it the 40%, get back to the big numbers. 20% of the of area has been already clear cut. So the Amazonia, uh, as Carlos mentioned about third way, the third way is to conservation. Conservation, we need to keep it 40% of the area has been already protected as indigenous land or conservation unit there. We need some bioeconomy there because some communities need it there and they need it to improve their, their livelihoods. The other 40% is needed for payment of environmental service plus biodiversity, bioeconomy. Otherwise, you're going to lose it. And the 20%, as uh, Carlos mentioned about the Amazonia two points, uh, uh, second way, of course, there we need improved agriculture. We need to increase our productivity. It's very low productivity today. Uh, so we need it. Two more questions, I think. Uh, the questions, I think, for this the conversation, how much does it cost actually to save or to go from a highly degrading, illegal, social conflict, Amazonia, to something that more approximate to what Carlos mentioned about 4.0 Amazonia? Uh, how much time left before? Is it going to be too late? Uh, it's difficult to tell, but the, 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 the new trends are not good. It's, it's moving very fast. Uh, what's the role of commun international communities? And I think, ooh, what's the role for, for a, a community like Harvard that can play in this the conversation? Um, thank you. Okay, that was short and sweet and to the point. Thank you, Beto. Uh, so now we are wrapping up the, the panel and the speakers for the conference with a different perspective. We have Daniela Bacas, who is a, uh, uh, an analyst, in fact, 
a bank, a financial analyst. Um, she's employed by the Brazilian Development Bank, BNDES, and has been working with environmental subjects since uh, 20, 2009, for 11 years. She works on the Amazon Fund, Green Finance, Vegetal Restoration, Climate Change, and Socio-Environmental Corporate Responsibility. Daniela is a legal, counsel, a legal counsel specialist in environmental law with training at the Universidade de São Paulo. She's currently head of the Environmental and Amazon Fund Department at the uh, Brazilian Development Bank, BNDES. So please share your perspective, uh, Daniela. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> uh, buenos dias, bom dia. Bom dia. Uh, I'll, uh, I'm an employee of the Brazilian National Development Bank, so I'm not an I'm academic person, not a scientist. So uh, the Brazilian Development Bank is one of the most uh, largest, uh, it was one of the largest ba development banks in the world with more than 60 years of existence. And in the last 10 years, uh, I have been dealing with this challenge and exciting job task to manage the Amazon fund. So I would like to, to share with you some of this experience, uh, mainly with some of the sustainable production activities that brings, brings us to the theme of the session by economy. And uh, just to put everyone on the same page, uh, I would just like to give you a quick overall view of the fund, because I don't know if everybody knows a, a little bit about it. So just the context. Um, the, the Amazon fund was established in 2008 due to a great uh, drop in deforestation rates that Brazil has conducted so far. So from 2004 to 2008, Brazil has dropped by half deforestation rates. And uh, this enabled uh, the Brazil government to uh, create a mechanism, a financial mechanism, a red plus mechanism to receive donations to keep up the, the improvement and support of the, the, the preservation and conservation projects in the Amazon region. Um, so uh, thanks to the donors, we have raised as manager uh, $1.3 billion. Uh, the main uh, donor is the government of Norway, followed by Germany, we have a small portion of the Brazilian state oil company, uh, Petrobras. So um, then we have, uh, we, we manage the fund, so it means that we are responsible for fundraising and also for selecting the projects, for analyze them and monitoring, tracking their implementation. And we have in our portfolio 103 projects now and a variety of beneficiaries, uh, uh, third sector NGOs, also federal government, Amazonian states, and universities and uh, institutes of research. The projects must be structured, which means they have to uh, follow a public policy in Brazil and be uh, trying to solve some uh, uh, equations there. And also we act by call for proposals for projects as well. Um, one of the great pillars of the Amazon Fund is the context of uh, a strategic plan that Brazil in 2004 uh, enacted, uh, and it's still valid, it's in fourth phase now. Uh, it's a strategic plan for combat prevention and control of deforestation of the Amazon region. So it has four axes, land use planning, monitoring control, sustainable production, and science innovation. And each one of the, the Amazon Fund projects must at, at least uh, fit in one of these axes, of this uh, great uh, plan, strategic plan. Uh, the governance is also uh, uh, a pillar of the, the fund. It has two committees. One is the guidance committee. Uh, it's a multi-stakeholder committee, uh, which uh, gives the, provides the, the criteria and 
uh, guidelines for the, um, the, the bank, the Brazilian Development Bank, to follow in the application of the resource, in the, in the approval of the projects. And also monitors uh, the application of resource. Uh, and also we have the, a technical committee uh, composed by renowned scientists that validates the figures of the deforestation rate that are uh, released by the National Institution for Space Research, INPE. So we have accumulated since then. Uh, uh, we are able to fundraise in more than $20 billion in terms of the great deforestation period, uh, the decreasing of the deforestation rates that Brazil has conducted. Um, also, another great pillar is transparency. We have a very uh, comprehensive website uh, through which we uh, give all information about the project and also about the, the program, the Amazon Fund. We have meetings with the donors. We have bulletins. We have uh, annual reports. And all, uh, it's important to, to say, to mention that all, uh, not only in level of the program, Amazon Fund, we have indicators uh, and the logical framework, but we uh, do have it in the, in the level of the projects, indicators for each one of them. So we um, also have this in our website. And uh, we are undertaking now, thanks to the German cooperation, GIZ, uh, an independent evaluation of the whole program because we are uh, with 10 years anniversary <laughs> celebration of the, the fund. And um, just give the highlights of the main theme supported. Uh, environmental monitoring uh, aims uh, mainly to attack some bottlenecks in terms of spatial resolution, uh, cloud covers that we have to 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 uh, have better views of the 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 deforestation through cloud covers, and we have also a pan Amazonian uh, project that aims to exchange monitoring systems among all the Amazonian countries. Uh, it's conducted by uh, uh, the, the organization of the Treaty of Co uh, Amazonian Cooperation. Uh, combating deforestation is also a, an issue. We have uh, so far improving the capaci capacity of missions of inspection of our main environmental agents in Brazil, IBAMA. Uh, we also support uh, forest fighters, strengthening their capacity with equipment and so uh, training systems uh, to combat forest fires. Uh, protected areas uh, are another issue for the, the Amazon Fund. More than 109 uh, conservation units we have su supported so far. More than 80% of the, the, the protected areas in the Amazon region. And also another kind of uh, protected areas are obviously indigenous land. Uh, and we have uh, been supporting many projects, two, 24 projects that have, uh, have uh, year market uh, activities for uh, protecting indigenous territories, uh, improving food security, sustainable production, and surveillance activities. Uh, science innovation, of course, is a cross-cutting sector and it aims also to uh, support environmental monitoring and uh, sustainable production. And uh, the rural environmental registers uh, is a rural register that the forest code uh, imp imposes to every landowner and it associates the individual to the land and their commitments uh, with restore the, the forest and also their liabilities with uh, deforestation. And uh, finally, we got to the main issue of this session, uh, the, the part of sustainable production, uh, that uh, a challenge, uh, you may say, I may say that it's not easy to have um, uh, a forest-based economy, sustainable-based forest economy in, in the Amazon regions due to all of the <laughs> challenges, the difficulties uh, uh, before mentioned here. Uh, but uh, we, we've been so far, and we think that uh, ch achieve and uh, reach ground level, local level is uh, an important issue. So just to skip all of this, <laughs> I can go directly to 
sustainable production, saving your time from my bad English. <laughs> so how could we, we uh, improve uh, the, the logistics and capillarity of the projects in the, in the region? Uh, we have supported 38 direct institutions, but it, it turns out to uh, become 338 institutions because they uh, conduct partnerships with local associations and cooperatives so we can reach more uh, entities there. Okay? And um, it actually benefits 162,000 people with sustainable production now in the Amazon region with the support of the fund. Uh, and what are, are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, processing oils, acai berries, cassava flour, uh, ecotourism, handcrafts, uh, fishery, sustainable timber uh, production, and also many other extractive activities. And just to give you a highlight over the main indicators on sustainable production, of course, we have more. You can uh, access our uh, website. But we have uh, 24,000 people trained in sustainable production. Uh, this is impressive. 36 million in proceeds from the sale of products. Uh, 22 million hectares of managed forests. Uh, more than 2,600 uh, small projects indirectly supported, and uh, 357 processing units. And you are talking about installed uh, by family farmers or traditional communities or indigenous groups that are the main beneficiaries, uh, uh, target of the Amazon Fund. Uh, as I said, we have more than 38 uh, projects directly in market for sustainable production. But every project has uh, its own his history. But just to give you an overview, uh, I picked four examples. Okay? Uh, the first one is developable forest that's from uh, the institution called Imaflora. Uh, I, I pick them because they are so different from each other. So this one promotes the consolidation of a certification of orange called Brazil's Orange. Uh, and they foster the promotion of sustainability in the whole chain of, for example, cacao or pepper and so on. And, and it reaches uh, the, the, the supermarket in the southeast part of Brazil, for example, with that seal, with that certification. And it is improving a chain in the, in the region, uh, in a sustainable way, of course. And Bolsa Floresta is led by Fundação Amazônia Sustentável. And uh, it's a, a kind of payment for environmental service for those families that uh, are associated and deliberating this association uh, a venue in, in conservation units in the Amazon state of Brazil. Uh, they deliberate how they can uh, invest in sustainable production. So it's a pa participatory methodology, and it's important to, to grow uh, ground from the ground, create uh, the, the base from the ground. And um, it's very interesting. Uh, we have also some two uh, examples. Uh, Portal Seeds um, is conducted by Instituto Oro Verde, and they, um, they found out that collecting seeds for reforest uh, would be like uh, 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 generating income for those collectors, and then uh, also bring, bring up the forest by uh, agrofor agroforest systems. So through collective, uh, collecting seeds plus <laughs> The, the planting of agroforestry systems with some opportunities to, to earn income from those productions, they are incentivating people to stay in the rural part of Brazil because um, some of them were uh, fleeing to the urban cities and so it's a very interesting different project. And the Forest Sentinels, it's 
uh, conducted by Copavan, that's a cooperative, cooperative in Brazil, that join efforts from indigenous groups and non-indigenous groups in the extraction and uh, productive uh, chain of the Brazil nuts. And it's interesting to, to mention that we have a great indicator of gender equality in this project because we have uh, women's associations uh, also uh, working in this project. And finally, uh, just uh, to give you an evolution that our view in terms of supporting sustainable activities in, in the Amazon Fund, uh, we uh, initially uh, began with direct promotion of some uh, activities. So if you, uh, some uh, project uh, is needing, for example, a refrigerator to restore the fish, it's, uh, it's important, and the projects were uh, investing in those kind of uh, uh, investments as well. But we, we found out that it was lacking like a view, a more perspective of a value chain. And then in 2017, we uh, conducted a call for proposal for projects that have more this view, broad view of not, uh, not only specific uh, processing units, but the whole chain, like uh, uh, taking a look at commercialization, branding, business plan, so we have could have a more broad view on the, the, the whole value chain. But we think that's not enough. We have to go further, integrating the private sector. And how can we do that? We think that impact investment might be an answer for that. Uh, and so we are dialoguing, we are uh, conducting discussions to which we have to bring blended finance, many sources of venture philanthropy with non-reimbursable funds, with reimbursable funds, with private active funds. So to join all these partnerships into more uh, impact investments in the Amazon region, the value chain. So we think this is a key opportunity to go further, have some examples uh, now in Brazil, in terms of social and environmental issues, and we are, uh, uh, very keen to, to go further in the discussion of the Amazon Fund as well. Uh, the learnings and challenges, I could not um, separate them uh, one from the other because the, the lessons learned are, are also still challenges so far. But uh, we mentioned some of them here, like capillarity, that we are uh, uh, bringing more entities through, through partnerships. Uh, but a, a, a great lesson I think it's important to deal with the Amazon is community particip participation. Um, projects from the ground, they have more opportunities to keep sustainability of results. So this is a, we cannot forget this kind of issue and have more benefit sharing as well. Uh, monitoring evaluation is a big challenge, it's an ongoing evolving process. Um, and we, it's difficult to collect the indicators, but we still uh, keep, keep on on this uh, task. And also, technical assistance is important to keep uh, sustainability of results. Scale, we think that we can uh, bring, bring in private sector also investments, can generate more income for those communities. Uh, and uh, I think innovation was put here as, uh, as like provoking also the scientific part of uh, the, the, the session as well, because uh, like uh, Nobri said, uh, there are several opportunities to not to innovate in terms of models, in terms of innovative projects, but also uh, social and environment technologies that can be replicable from one project to the other with a cost efficient, enough cost efficient base. But uh, uh, also uh, have opportunities to, to create new and discover new value chains in the Amazon region. So uh, I think this uh, word here is, um, is a key for bringing uh, and strengthening all the other uh, issues and uh, achieving sustainability of the results that it our utmost uh, goal. So thank you for your attention. So thank you, Daniela. Please may I invite the panelists to the table. 
And uh, I would open the floor. First of all, I wish, would like to thank the panelists for their uh, presentations and their own ideas on innovation. I would like to just uh, request, please, should you have a question, uh, please, we're following the Kennedy School rules, please identify yourself, name, affiliation, should you wish, um, and then a good question has two things. It should be concise, short, to the point, and your, if we were looking at your notes, we would see a question mark at the end of your question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so, I, I, I open the floor, please. Let's think big, innovative, creative. We have a microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, Augusto Sampini from the Vatican. Um, a question to Professor Nobre um, about the, um, the third way. So I, I'm, I really enjoy your presentation. Thank you very much for the wonderful, uh, thought-provoking um, presentation. But my question is about the role of technology. Um, because in this encyclical, uh, Pope Francis, Laudato Si, about how to redefine development on, on the face of this ecological crisis, he warns us about the role of technology. It's because technology is not neutral. Is, is uh, and especially the new technology that we have. Uh, it has already not just a moral background, but also a financial background, and and is normally um, managed by the people who are already in power. So my question is: Is it your third? How do you address this problem of the possible technological um, uh, paradigm that? that that is that would replicate the model that you want to change. How how do you address this uh, this topic uh, with your model? Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, th this is a very good question. Uh, there are there are no simple answers to that, but let's separate a little bit the different technologies. Uh, digital transformation of materials. Let's say you you have a, an idea. In the future, we want all employees to become employers becoming designers. So that's the job of the future, designing. And the material transformation will be carried out by machines. So this model also thinks about that. So the, the, the cost of this digital transformation of the physical world is reducing so much that will be really very inexpensive in the future. And uh, uh, on, on Monday, some of us visit MIT's Fab Lab. So this is really the way to go. I'm not saying uh, it's the only way to go, and I'm not saying this distribute free uh, available technology will win, but we hope this model will win. This is part. The other more complicated part is with communications. Communications is much more complicated because uh, there are only a few companies in the world which have all the power really, to distribute the communications that we share globally. I, I'm not an expert on that. I, have, I, I don't know if I can make any projections whether also communication will become uh, decentralized and not uh, in, within the hands of a few, five, two, three, five companies. Uh, yes, there are some dangers, uh, in, particularly in sharing information uh, in dark web and things like that. Uh, it's hard to predict how that will go, but at least in this model, a, 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 a central element is to empower the people with the tools to enter the 21st century world that we are living in. It's unstoppable. I mean, the, the, this, the way automation, uh, digital revolution, biotechnological revolution, this is unstoppable. And how to bring that world of technology 
in a productive sense, uh, meaning that you know, in the future, forest people will be designers of solutions as well. It may take a few decades, but that, that's the, the hope. Uh, however, I, we are very aware of the risks, uh, but there are some risks that we cannot counter at this point, because there are global risks, and particularly associate, associated with the power of some of these big companies, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is something that's not a problem only for our model, it's the problem for the planet. And, and we have to find ways, and I'm not an expert, there may be people who understand this issue much better. Uh, we have to find ways to avoid this concentration of technological power to a, a level that's becoming almost like a, impossible to predict the dictatorship. So, I, I see that danger, but uh, we are only beginning to develop this model that we will have really to, to live with that danger and to pay attention to that. But that at least our initial thought is to, to bring that empowerment. That has to come, as we heard in the other three presentations, has to come with social empowerment as well. Technology is just one element. Uh, uh, not, not, uh, it's not all elements, but uh, it's important element because if we don't bring technology, then uh, really the value uh, uh, of that bioeconomy becomes very little. And what we hear, we hear from from the other presentations and yesterday, you know, the practice of deforestation will, you know, swipe, you know, we will. We'll clear all the forests. So technology may be a very critical element, not the only one. Hi. Uh, Felipe Edwards from Chile. I have a question for Brigitte um, that involves what we said today, but also what we've heard yesterday. I'm struck by the people who are not in this room, um, the people who are doing the burning, the people who are destroying the forests, and how we can get them involved in this conversation as well. Uh, in the US, there have been mentions of the presidents of Brazil and the presidents of the US. Uh, it's not just the, the presidents of these countries. Uh, these presidents were voted by millions and millions of people. and the ideas or the world views of those people aren't being represented here, and I wonder how we can talk to them, how we can involve them in this conversation so we can change their minds and uh, have them have a sense of uh, the values that we are looking to promote and perhaps change their, uh, change their minds. Uh, this is not a one-sided conversation. Uh, they feel talk down to, they feel we don't understand them, they feel threatened in their jobs in their, uh, and in their communities. And if the saving of the Amazon has a lot of different fronts, a lot of different areas to attack them, perhaps one of the places where they can be attacked, we don't even have to go to the Amazon, we have to go to Ohio and go to Middleton, Ohio, and talk to the family of J.D. Vance and the Hillbilly Elegy people, and get them to understand that this affects them as well. You mentioned, Brigitte, that uh, you have an amazing uh, uh, alliance between the far right and the far left in destroying the government, in destroying the forest. If we can't, if that can happen to destroy the forest, maybe we can get of strange alliances to save the forest too. Do you think that's possible? Yes. Okay. Uh, that would be quite a quest, but uh, I think it's possible, yes, because the extremes are usually minorities. Uh, we all want to really overcome the obstacles. We really want to live in peace to, to get a decent salary or to have a, a job. And when you talk with the local communities, uh, they are really uh, willing to engage in that sort of discussion, being the local communities very well 
um, affected or very well um, embedded in the far left uh, tradition of the rural movements in Colombia. Uh, but they have uh, offered the right, rightist government to take care of the forest. They assembled a small document of five pages saying, we can stop deforestation and we can compromise. This is our proposal. And you read the proposal, it's so simple. It's just a bit of education, a bit of health, very, very liberal issues. Not, nothing really uh, to scare anybody. And some roads uh, that could be probably negotiated, but the most important issues that are well organized and they are offering a very important result. So why cannot we, s we sit around this proposal and discuss it? It doesn't cost too much. It's just political will. But then that's what we need. A bit of push from the international community, a bit of uh, help to, I think, to, to, to put us on the same table to share our talks and design an agreement. And it's easier to negotiate between the, the extremes because you don't negotiate with your friends. You think that your friends are think the same. So I think that's a, a good opportunity, particularly for Colombia in this moment of, of, of history. And, and just if I may add, of course, there's an important role of communicators, <laughs> conflict mediators. Uh, uh, these people should be on our on the teams, right? Yeah. So why don't we shift from you? I think you. And you, you, and then to the, to the right. Maybe two, three questions. Thanks. Uh, so thanks for the wonderful presentations. Um, I am a software developer. So everywhere, the, every, every time that I look at these presentations, I look at products and I see ways of making money. But that vision could be criticized as something like, I am being a colonizer. I am imposing my ideas of engineering products to sell like um, Amazon products as a, as a uh, Brazilian white person. And um, I am a, a fellow at the, G, uh, the Kennedy School and I run a series of workshops and I'm pretty convinced that data is development and that we can apply this uh, concept to save not just the Amazon, but also what is left from the Cerrado, which is the place where I grew up and I see, I, I saw the land being destroyed by the soy planting and all this stuff. So how do we deal with this criticism of like, at the same time, we don't wanna be like the new colonizers, but we know that we could make life better and bring wealth through the development of digital products made in Brazil. Like, how do we deal with this dichotomy? Or, like, that's, that for me is a real problem. Mm -hmm. Does anybody Maybe. Hmm? Maybe another question? Uh, Does any, do you want to address that one? And okay. Working, yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Just give my my view on that. Um, when you're talking about red uh, uh, plus mechanisms, we think firstly in safeguards. No, so uh, basically addresses what I said that community participation is a key, not only by safeguards, but to also to sustain to have uh, the the results. So I think that. Um, it's not a kind of, uh, we are not imposing. I think the projects must come from the ground. And there are many communities now willing to, to share this view with academy, with civil society participation, with governments as well, integrating their, their own view and their, uh, their wishes in terms of development. So we have to listen to them, to uh, address their issues, and combine uh, uh, discussion, uh, participatory discussion on all the, those uh, partnerships, stakeholders, to have a, a, 
a, a great opportunity to to follow their their own uh, wishes. That I think it's possible, and it's in a, in innovation ecosystems. That is a, a thing that we are also discussing. It's able to join all those uh, partnerships uh, in having the the traditional communities listen. I just want to, to can I complement? Uh, it, it's your question. Your question is very, very good, very interesting. You know, I complement Daniela's answer, saying, of course, uh, your question addresses this issue whether we want to create a more equal or less equal society in the future. It's only ma about making money and getting wealthier and wealthier, and a few people, inequality as we are seeing to grow in here. In, in, in Latin America, in most parts of the world. I don't think that's our idea. The idea is really to share these innovations broadly. Biodiversity is local. Endemism is very high in the Amazon, in the, in the savannas, in Cerrado as well. So I'm not going to say it's easy to overcome those challenges, but at least that's the desire, to make it very available and to create conditions for local innovation development as well. And whether in, this, in the future we are going to become a much less unequal, more, uh, more equal society, I cannot predict. That's our desire, but it's very hard to say whether the pathways of the planet, the globe, will go in that direction. There are a lot of questions, so why don't we take three in a row and then uh, pose to the panel? Yeah, Hello. Please. Oh. oh, sorry. Yes, okay, please, 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 and then. Okay, sorry about that. Um, hi, uh, my name is Tiago Simões. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. Um, and I've seen today, yesterday and today, a uh, lot of very uh, interesting uh, solutions uh, economically and scientific to the problem that we're facing in the Amazon. Uh, we also see a lot of um, emergency. Uh, we, we are on, really on the tipping point because whatever we decide to implement will take years and we have a couple of decades maybe until we reach a point of no return. So we really are on, on a moment that we need to make very concrete and large scale decisions. And um, at the same time we are facing uh, a very, and we have been facing that for a really, uh, for a long time, a very strong lobby on the Brazilian government and other governments uh, uh, for diversification of the Amazon, uh, the growth of agribusiness and that kind of stuff, even in a very inefficient manner. And especially the current government in Brazil, and this has been discussed a lot here uh, by some other people too, uh, there is a very strong uh, motivation uh, provided by the current government and administration of Brazil for that kind of enterprise. We really are not taking care of the Amazon. And as Brazilians, we like to think that the Amazon is ours, but it's really not. It's shared with eight other countries. Um, isn't it time maybe for an international panel, including scientists, economists, and so on, to take care of the land management in the Amazon? So let's put that on hold. Is it time for uh, uh, an international panel on land management? Uh, please. Uh, Marcia Castro, uh, Harvard School of Public Health. Um, I have a question for Carlos, um, very direct. Um, third way, extremely fascinating. Um, so my question, which I think is highly predictable based on what I said yesterday, is health part of it? Um, is it included? And if not, are you open for discussions about how health is important to achieve the 4.0, otherwise it's going to be 3.5. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and just across, yes. Yeah, so third question, then we return to the panel. Please. Thank you. The wonderful talks. Um, I want to address uh, Mr. Verissimo, but, but first I want to say I spent a better part of a year when I was a young, idealistic uh, PhD in Colombia. <laughs> Uh, and I was headquartered in Var uh, Haveriana, but, uh, but, I, but I really wanted to go here. Um, it seems to me that the talks I've heard are very idealistic. They're, they're realistic and idealistic, and I thought your talk was quite different. 
there. Your talk was either pessimistic or on the less idealistic side of realism. And so, um, you know, one thing that I felt was missing in, in the presentation, and it's an opportunity, I guess I want to say, is, you know, we have a billion more people coming on the globe in 14 years. That's, that's the rate. And uh, we have climate change it's all around us. And, and don't you think a part of the solution is for governments and, and bright people like you to identify places in Brazil, Colombia, Peru, et cetera, which are actually countries which could absorb a lot of that billion people better than Africa and Asia. But at any rate, identify places where you could make communities that would work, that would be jobs or be economy viable and so on, to pull some of the pressure off of the Amazon rainforest. So that's that's a hypothesis. <laughs> but what I want to get to, uh, Verissimo, would you say something about what you feel might be a realistic uh, forward step, given what we've all heard. Would you identify yourself, please, sir? I'm sorry? Would you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Richard Foreman. I'm an ecologist here at Harvard. Wonderful. Thank you. So we have, a, is there a land management, international panel for land management? Uh, is that a good next step? That's number one. Is health part of it? And, uh, and, and what's the realistic next step? Uh, maybe address them in, in order? Uh, oh, Marcia, yes, you were invited already. <laughs> so it's back to 4.0. Absolutely, I mean, health should be, sorry not to stress that in my presentation, health should be a very important, uh, certainly one or more of these Amazon Creative Labs have to be directed to health issues, and that the modern medicine, you know, uh, remotely operations, all those things have to be to come, and also the possibilities of new pharmaceuticals, you know, absolutely. So, uh, you know, you are invited as important member of this coalition. Uh, about the, the first question, this is a difficult issue. I mean, of course, uh, international uh, efforts, I mean, they are there. I mean, you know, climate convention, it's a big international effort. Brazil's NDC commitments, uh, 12 million hectares of restoration, 43% of redu reductions of emissions by 2030. I'm sure all the other Amazonian countries have similar commitments. So we are guided, we are abiding by some international uh, commitments. Is it working? No. So that's a different issue. Oh, a global commons. Uh, I think, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, I, I'm not sure, we passed that time. Uh, fortunately, there is Antarctica as a global commons. Uh, I think, you know, that discussion was prevailing after World War II, and uh, at the same time, uh, people were discussing about Antarctica, and uh, that was really one of the reasons the governments of Brazil, before milita military governments, they started really be being very careful about the future of the Amazon and the, during the military government uh, to avoid any threat of internationalization of, of the Amazon. Then they created this big push. They would send tens of thousands of farmers without any knowledge of a wet system just to go there, clear whatever, get all the money you need to clear as a geopolitical statement. This is Brazilian and we do not want other, other, you know, sovereignty, sovereignty. So that's what I'm saying. Although we might try to transform, in fact, all, all yesterday and today, what we are saying, what we are discussing is, is how to transform the Amazon is a, in a global common, but being managed by the nine nations without becoming an Antarctica uh, and without any, any uh, by laws that would prohibit any exploration of natural resources. So it's a, it's a difficult challenge, but certainly that's the, that's the concept. It's a global comment for the planet. I think on the, on the ways to go from here, uh, one point is that we uh, will 
until last year, we were able to reduce deforestation up to 72%. So we are, we are on the right track. The question is now that they are changing their course and, and then might get in the wrong direction. So that's why we raise the flag that we need to keep it way we has moved. Uh, there's a lot of room for agriculture intensification so we can keep it easily. Then 20% of area has been already clear cut for the next 10, 15 years without clear a single tree because there was a lot of room for productivity. Well, just to give idea about uh, carrot productivity, it it's, can multiply by 10 times without any major technological breakthrough. It's just like apply, it's close the frontier. If you don't close the frontier, there are always an opportunity for them to advance. So Brazil has created three major elements that, that protected the areas. Very good enforcement system that was based on, on, on satellite monitoring. It was almost real-time data that allows them to be more effective. And a lot of dialogue among the private sector NGOs, local government, uh, public attorneys, federal judges. So what was possible because it was a combination of dialogue and, and investment. So back to your point as well, there's a lot of good people there. They don't want, if they vote in Brazil, if the election was, who was going to be uh, promote sustainable development in the Amazon, the, rest, the outcome is going to be different. I think 90% of the Brazilian population wants to Amazonia to be uh, develop in a sustainable way. So in the case of the Brazilian Amazon, we have only 25 million people in an area of 5 million kilometers square. It's quite feasible to have a, a better future. So to get to the, to the uh, Amazonia 4.0, we need to move to the Amazonia 3.0. That in the, it means we don't have yet all the, the benefits of the technology in a short term of time, but we can get much better in terms of agriculture. We can keep it all conservation units protected. We can make some advance and some key uh, uh, value chains like cocoa and other products. So I'm in a way a little bit pessimistic of what's going on right now, but I think we, if we get the right message, we can get out and get back to the right track. Please. I just would like to insist on the issue of environmental justice. While climate change is being caused by the northern countries and the cost of this climate change is huge and it's restricting all possibilities for other developed or developing countries. Uh, we want to take any uh, s sensible decision about uh, restricting our way to well-being. It doesn't matter how do we define that. It's that we just, uh, Colombian emissions are 0.04% of the total emissions of the world. So, and even the government promised to reduce emissions uh, in the last Paris COP, which I think is a big mistake. We, we cannot reduce our emissions because it's useless, mm -hmm. but it's destroying our innovation capacity because we have to really uh, trust in cooperation, international cooperation and technological transfer to do something else. So unless there's some sense of more investments based on the issue of environmental justice, I think we are losing the Amazon. Yeah. And if I may build on that, uh, Brigitte, thank you for that, bringing the injustice bit up. One of you mentioned earlier uh, the bad guys, I think. And, and, I, and, and my question would be, in order to, to promote a, a bioeconomy based on sustainable production and, and justice and equity, um, it's, that economy has to compete with the bad economy, the informal, illegal unsustainable things and uh and and so how do we how do you keep for lack of a better word how do you keep the bad guys out you know can, can i make i think we of course we didn't discuss here the questions of uh, a legal framework that needed the question of property rights the questions of transaction costs associated uh, it also needed to be put in, in perspective. Uh, there will be another conversation about that. But uh, I think more and more, I've, I live in the Amazon the last 35 years. I, I think I'm, I'm quite optimistic that a lot of people want to jump it if it makes sense in economic terms. I think more and more people, that I, I explained that uh, carrier ranchers, other players, if they found a way they can do better 
in business uh, and they can comply with the law, if the government push a little bit in, a, in the right direction, they, they, can, they can be part of the solution. Yeah. Uh, they are not uh, uh, people that, that are um, adverted to this conversation, most of them. And I think in this way, I think we be able to move forward. Uh, the questions, I think we, that we discuss a lot of technology and that's a very good part. Uh, the role of the international market, the role of the international community, but the, 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 the needed to include the question of property right and who owns, the, who owns the knowledge and how we can actually deal with, um, that, that was questions that need to be addressed in another conversation, but, but it, uh, otherwise uh, it will be difficult for us to move because um, technology is key element, policy is another element, market, cultural and bureaucratic structure needs to be also be addressed. And as a combination of this, it, it, it needs, that's going to move us forward. Yeah. Okay, okay, listen, uh, I've been informed that we have time out for this panel. Uh, we will have closing remarks from our organizers. Thank you so much, uh, panelistas and uh, participants for... Okay, so that concludes our last session. We would like to thank again everyone uh, from being here these two days, participating in, this, in the discussions, and especially to the moderators and speakers um, of all sessions. Uh, so I'd like to highlight here, so we are, here are the three people uh, who, who well, so we are the organizers of this uh, symposium. And, and I think uh, we are all here now because it shows uh, the commitment uh, of, uh, of people here at Harvard at different levels. So the director of the Center for Latin American Studies, Brian Farrell, a young professor, uh, Bruno Carvalho by my side, and a postdoctoral fellow, myself, Bruno de Medeiros, who, who are all committed to uh, engaging in, uh, in uh, collaborations uh, with people uh, in, in Brazil and the other countries of the Amazon uh, um, going forward. Um, so uh, I, I think I would like to pass the word to Bruno, who will talk a little bit more about that. Yep. Obrigado, Bruno. So First, I want to re reiterate and echo all the, the, the really deep gratitude and thanks to, to the Dr. Class staff and everybody who came from very far to, to, to be part of this. Uh, I'll start with a very explicit comment, building off of, of, of Beatus and others that were made in, in different ones, partly because I'm, I'm in a position to be explicit um, uh, about this. Uh, rolling back the force code would be catastrophic. Uh, this is a project uh, 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 of the son of the president, of Flavio Bolsonaro. It has buy-in within the Brazilian Congress. This is something without which our inspirational visions uh, uh, become uh, obsolete. So this is an agenda for now, all hands on deck, supporting the folks in the front lines, including the, the Yanomami, and we're so happy to have Davi Kopenawa here, and supporting those of us who are fighting against rolling back this forest code. This is, this is the agenda for, we leave this meeting, we're all on it in whatever way, shape, or form we can do that. Now, other agendas where each of us uh, um, um, have, have uh, different roles, um, you know, I, I work mostly as a cultural historian, so I don't use the word unprecedented lightly, uh, but we really are facing a, a very unprecedented uh, set of challenges. Uh, as somebody who spends a lot of time thinking about the past, what I can, the good news from the past is that large scale transformations do happen throughout human history. So the sorts of things that we need to happen uh, have happened before. Uh, so again, all, all, all um, hands of deck and, and, and time, uh, for action, and in that sense, it is, it's, it's so inspiring to, to, to have uh, uh, um, folks thinking through ways through which we can transform our economies and turn them into uh, sustainable bioeconomies. And we have so many of those uh, around the room who've, who've done it in the past and we're thinking that through the future. So, so it's, 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 it's great. Um, to some extent, we've reproduced here the sorts of diversity uh, uh, without all the exuberance of, of the forest itself. It's really, it's, it's astounding how we moved from the molecular uh, through the, the embodied uh, to the planetary, the, the, the national, the regional, the planetary, all the way to the cosmic. We have from a shaman to, to, to people trained in, in, in molecular uh, uh, sciences. Um, 
And that's something a place like, like Harvard and our universities, I think, uh, can do. So we, and when I say we, I speak on, on behalf of Brun and Brian, but on behalf of other Harvard faculty members who, are, who work on the Amazon, think uh, Harvard needs to step up. We, we need to do more. We need sort of an Amazonia initiative. For this to work, it has to be partnerships with our colleagues and institutions in Brazil, with our colleagues and institutions in the Amazon. Uh, but, you know, uh, Harvard can provide the sort of stability that uh, our governments can't provide, and a forum for transnational exchanges, because for the macaws, our national boundaries are completely meaningless, and, and we have something to learn from our macaws, too. So I, he I think here we can provide a space where the Amazon is, is a truly Pan-Amazonian, transnational, interdisciplinary, diverse uh, place, and, and one that's crucial for the planet. So I think we're, we're, we're ready to, to step up. Thank you all. Uh, we, we, will, we will need everybody here uh, working together, all hands on deck. And again, thank you. Before passing on to Brian, a round of applause to Gillian Scales, Gabby Patterson, and um, everybody else who's made this possible. Thank you all uh, from the bottom of my heart. Um, clearly, we're facing a tragedy of the commons, the degradation of a common good that's owned by none but used by all. Uh, that's gonna, what's going to require is uh, to rise to this challenge, and the challenge is of creating a stable symbiosis between people and planet. What's required are partnerships that are across disciplines, across interest groups, between countries. So we at Dr. Class and the Vice Provost uh, for research here at Harvard are committed to an Amazonia initiative. Uh, the first step was begun in these last two days. The next steps will be in Brazil and here as well. So we're very excited about that. The second thing that's required is courage. A courage was defined by the poet Robert Frost as a willingness to act on insufficient evidence and limited knowledge. <laughs> May we all have courage and remember that courage is infectious. Thank you. Thank you.